Hey there, uh, Why Religion Podcast friends. This is Professor Anthony Sweat from BYU. Great to be with you again, as always. As we produce these episodes and prepare to release them, we're fast approaching summertime. Normally, most of us would be making travel plans uh, to go on family vacations and visit some great places and probably spend $10 for an overpriced slice of pizza at some theme park. But uh, because of COVID-19, we don't really know how this summer is going to go, do we? With the coronavirus keeping most of the country currently quarantined and gathering restrictions in place in many places, we thought we would bring you a few podcast episodes to help you mentally travel or to assist you when you do get to go out and travel again. So our next two episodes are going to deal with research publications and productions related to touring Latter-day Saint church history sites. This particular episode centers on the Hallowed Ground Sacred Journeys video series produced by BYU Religion Professor Craig Osler. And our next episode, number nine, will be with BYU Religion Professor Scott Esplin on his publication on Carthage Jail and Dark Tourism, or in other words, why we visit sites where tragic events have occurred. For today's episode, Dr. Craig Osler has been working for about 20 years to produce around 100 peer-reviewed videos on church history sites with experts explaining and taking you on a church history video tour. It's called Hallowed Ground and Sacred Journeys. And so the purpose of the videos was to take that experience and offer it to people around the world. Because when you put it on the, the internet, <laughs> it's, not confi- it's not confined. Yeah, anybody we have can people go all at, at every continent that's watched these videos. And th- hopefully that's able to help strengthen their uh, their faith and their understanding and to recognize this is real okay it's almost like i live in australia but i feel like i've been in the sacred grove Mm. i live in africa but i've been to mendon new york you know (laughs) and that's kind of the feedback we've received of how they feel they feel more connected to that they're part of the church and you don't have to be a uh, a Utah member of the church or a United States member of the church to, to be able to feel like you're part of the early foundations of the Restoration. So get ready to go on an auditory church history tour as Professor Craig Osler takes you through insights from places like Palmyra, Menden, Kirtland, Missouri, Nauvoo, and Salt Lake City. And he helps us understand why learning, seeing, and experiencing these sites is so beneficial. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. As we start this episode, I also want to note on a personal level that this is a special episode because after about 40 years of being a full-time religious educator uh, for the church educational system and here at Brigham Young University, uh, Professor Craig Osler is set to retire from BYU this summer. Uh, We love uh, Craig and we will miss him. And we're so grateful for the contributions that he has made uh, to religious education and to thousands of students over the decades of his profession. Uh, Personally, his book, Revelations of the Restoration, that he co-authored with Joseph Fielding McConkie, it was a foundational text for me as I was a young seminary teacher teaching Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, He'll talk a little bit about that text later on in this episode. Anyway, we just want to say to Craig, we love you. We are grateful for you, and we will miss you in the halls of the Joseph Smith Building. In part one, he's specifically going to talk about sites in Palmyra, Colesville, Menden, New York, Kirtland, and Missouri. Throughout this, we've interspersed audio clips from his video series, including, at one moment, getting to hear the beautiful, melodic voice of Professor Lloyd Newell, the voice of music and the spoken word. Professor Casey Griffiths from Church History and Doctrine is the one who interviewed uh, his colleague, Professor Osler. So let's kick off and hear their interview. 
Craig, I want to talk to you a little bit about some experience you have that's that's unique and that I don't know if there's a, a member of our faculty that's been to more church history sites more often than you have. In fact, you've developed this great site that has virtual tours, which are these uh, videos that kind of walk a person through the sites. Now, can you start off by telling me why you feel like it, it changes a person's perspective to actually see uh, the place where some of these events took place and, and be in the surrounding environment. Sure. There's a couple of things that happened. One is even in studies, we found that uh, museums are going on site, helps individuals uh, realize this is real. This really happened. And it, it gives more opportunity for faith to be strengthened. And that was the purpose of it. And the other part is, I believe in the spirit of sight, that when you're on the site, there's things that you can uh, perceive and enjoy that you can't off-site. People emphasize that you can gain a testimony without going to uh, the Sacred Grove or Carthage Jail or, you know, over even to the Holy Land. And I'm going, of course you can, but it's not going to be as rich as it could be if you were there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've had that experience uh, for many years. The first time that uh, I actually went to church history sites was in 1979. Well, what was the occasion? What were you doing? I was a seminary teacher and... Uh, the stake president had asked several seminary teachers to form a, a nonprofit company where the seminary senior graduates could go back to church history sites. And they did so, and so I did that for several years. And then I began working with BYU Travel Study when they had their office and found that there just there's parts of understanding church history that just were so much clear to me. And I saw the change that came to the individuals who were there is it dawned on them that this really happened. And so I hoped by going through video, not just to walk them and show them, well, here's a table or here's a chair, but to do everything I could to recreate the spirit of the site in the video and make it educational that uh, went beyond just simply talking about, you know, the nuts and bolts, what a site looked like, but they felt like they were there. Mm -hmm. That was at least our, our hope and intent when we began the project. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't have a chance to visit many sites until I came to BYU, and they have this wonderful experience, a new faculty tour where you start in, um, <laughs> you start in Missouri and work your way back east. You go backwards. Uh, but that was, for instance, the first time I had a chance to walk into the Sacred Grove and uh, see the geography of how close the grove is to the Hill Cumorah, to the Smith Farm, and, and put all that picture together. Now, it, there's so much uh, focus right now on the First Vision because we're coming up on the Bicentennial. What are some insights you you have gained from spending time in Palmyra in those areas around the Smith Farm? Like, What are some things that you picked up on while you were there? One is I think you indicated uh, just the geography of how close things were to one another. But the other part is I felt like I came away owning church history. It was mine. I'd been there. I'd relived it. I'd walked where they walked. Uh, when it came to the sacred grove, I've been there, and this sounds a little funny, but more times than I really can count. <laughs> And every time uh, I've grown, but the purpose has been to allow others just to have the sacred grove, the spirit of the sacred grove, uh, come into their heart in the, in the way that they need. And I've watched that happen. Um, the other part is, um, I guess, seeing how much we still can retrace of, like in Palmyra. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you ask Palmyra, the other thing is, well, how far was it from Palmyra to Fayette? How far was it from Palmyra to go down to the area of Colesville, New York, or into Old Harmony in Pennsylvania? And that gave perspective in understanding what was going on and how involved the Prophet Joseph Smith was. And I have done quite a bit of research with the Doctrine and Covenants. Thank you. You know, familiar with the commentary that uh, Joseph Fielding McConkie and I wrote, you know, 1,200 pages because Deseret Book said we had to make it smaller than we wanted. Kind of <laughs> uh, but that was the other part is I would is I would read scripture in connection with being on the site. Then it, it hit me very strongly that we read a few words of the Lord giving directions to the prophet Joseph Smith of what was needed in bringing about the restoration, but that he might spend the next month fulfilling the Lord's directions of what he's to do to be able to bless the kingdom. And that became 
helpful to me to recognize that when you receive a, a call or a direction, you know, in teaching even, it might be another month or year for you to carry out <laughs> and, and hopefully bring to pass those things they've asked you to do, and it's okay. That's how the Lord was with Joseph Smith, too. What are some, um, I, I noticed the videos not only talk about kind of the classic church history sites, but uh, down the road from Palmyra is Menden. Uh, yes. Where Brigham Young uh, grows up and where he's living when, when he experiences the restoration. What are some experiences or things you've learned at, at some of the sites that are off the beaten path? Well, I love Menden. I came to appreciate Brigham Young through his Menden years that I couldn't from any place else. And and we don't often hear about Brigham Young pre the church. What are some things no. that a person so, would need to know? Well, one is we went to the properties uh, where he had his shop. You know, he did a lot of woodworking and he was a glazier with glass. And so he was able to see how what it meant that he built his home over a stream so he could have power through a paddle wheel to run his lathe. <laughs> And then we followed up to Valland Town Museum also because uh, Sheldon Fisher, who had been a local historian there years ago, had collected quite a few things from the property when he did kind of a archaeological dig without being a professional, uh -huh. you know. So here's two things I learned, and uh, we'll start at the most important first. When I read about his Menden years and visited what was happening, I realized it wasn't just Brigham Young that lived there. His father moved there. His other family members, brothers and sisters moved there, which then gave meaning to uh, Samuel Smith's first missionary journey. If you remember, he leaves a copy of the Book of Mormon with Phineas Young. Mm -hmm. Well, it sure made a whole lot more sense when I'm seeing, well, this is where Phineas Young was living. This is where John Young Sr., the father, was living. This is where uh, Brigham Young was living. Uh, this is where um, Heber C. Kimball was living. The father of Brigham Young. Born in Massachusetts, John had served in the American Revolutionary War. Years later, he moved west to Minden, New York. While here, his son, Brigham Young, helped to build the family home. You know, on and on to see, yeah, all these people are near one another. And then to read uh, the peoples uh, of that time, their feeling about Brigham Young when his sweet wife, uh, from what we tell, you know, has, they call it like consumption, and they write in their journals how every day, every morning, he would pick her up from the bed, because she's an invalid, carry her to a rocking chair in front of the fireplace, get her something to eat, get the children ready, and then go off to work, because he's a, pretty much a day laborer. Mm -hmm. Come back at noon to make sure they're okay. Take care of them, go back to work again. He is so solicitous, it brought tears to my eyes, <laughs> thinking, this is the Brigham Young I didn't know about. Yeah. A man who is dedicated to family. Then the fun part, sorry, there's lots here. <laughs> when you go to Valentown Museum, and it's in the videos that we've created. I hope anyone listens to this will go watch the video because I think they'll love it. Mm -hmm. The Valentown Museum, they have this stick there, and they have a stone with holes in it. It's kind of flat. And they've got a little uh, identifier for them. They say, this is Brigham Young's healing cane. This is Brigham Young's seer stone. <laughs> and I was there with Gary Lehman, who was like a docent at the mm -hmm. Valentown Museum. And I said, where did he get this idea? And he was kind of, you know, the, Sheldon Fisher is the one who had done that. And Gary looked at me and he said, well, I, I don't know. And he was kind of hesitant. And I said, well, I just don't know how you know that stick even belonged to Brigham Young. Or that stone even belonged to Brigham Young let alone that it was a healing cane or it was a seer stone. <laughs> and I said, plus, if I had a healing cane, I'd take it with me. And if I had a seer stone, I'd take it with me. And he just started laughing. He says, oh, I wondered that too, but I thought I was going to offend, you know, the Mormons, as they referred to us at that time. <laughs> and so when you say good off the beaten path, sometimes it, you just have a more full uh, picture of people that matter in early church history. And Brigham Young's just one example. There are so many that that same thing happens for. We mentioned Samuel Smith's mission, you know, in Tomlinson Inn and other places that you come to feel that you know them. Like I say, I own that. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I, I'd, I'd love to keep moving this tour to the West then. So if we switched focus from... That New England area yes. to uh, Kirtland in Missouri. 
what are some interesting sites there that and experiences that you've had? Many videos, you know, you've got the Neil K. Whitney store at the School of the Prophets room upstairs in which you can try to help people to, to feel what it would have been like to have been a participant or in the office uh, to feel like you're there when Joseph receives revelation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the greatest insights was to understand the church's for-profit owned businesses. Well, what were some things that you've learned about that? I know you have. Yeah, well, with the United Firm, I came to understand better how much the Lord was involved in having uh, the law of consecration mean that the church would take over, for example, Mill Kate Winnie's store, uh, close by there, the tannery, you know, that Sidney Rigdon oversaw, the, um, especially the ashery. Perhaps equal in importance to the Neil K. Whitney store in the building of the kingdom of God economically is the ashery. Therefore, it's worthy of closer examination. And that, I hope, will help students today when they hear things about church-owned business profits, Mm -hmm. that they'll say, wow, the Lord had this in mind clear back in 1831, (laughs) 1832. He knows what he's doing. And so passages in the scripture, such as saying that uh, through these uh, for-profit church-owned businesses, that the church will be able to stand uh, independent uh, from all creatures beneath the celestial world. And he's talking about uh, temporal things. That he was looking toward our day, but it started there. Even though we're doing it in a kind of a virtual way, as you referred to it, is people who aren't able to be in the site It's as if they're transported in vision right? and taken there. We had incredible things. You you asked, I I was going to share just some of the things that happened is, for example, we wanted to help people understand the leg surgery that the young prophet Joseph Smith received when he was in West Lebanon uh, there in New Hampshire. And there's nothing there to see. <laughs> it's asphalt. <laughs> There's, you know, some businesses built over where the home was. But we were able to recreate by going to uh, a hospital and to Dartmouth uh, Medical uh, Admissions Building and find the saddlebags and the ins- medical instruments that, as far as we can tell, uh, Dr. Nathan Smith used on it during that surgery. Mm-hmm. Well, then the next thing that happens is... Uh, I find out that uh, we have a connection to Dr. Leroy uh, Worthlin, who uh, wrote an article about the uh, leg surgery years ago for BYU Studies. And he comes and and so part of the video, uh, videos we do include experts interviews, Mm -hmm. not on site. And he brings all the instruments and shows the, you know, 18th and 19th century medical instruments that would have been used in that surgery but this would be the scalpel, and then he would use his finger to expose the bone. And then to get into the bone, he'd have to make little drill holes. And then he would take a hay saw and connect the, the burr holes. And then with the pincers, remove that. Then he would go in with a pair of these bone crushing things and break up the uh, piece that's contained within and then reach in and pull it out. And shows how they're used. And then, so it's like, we really are taking people not just to the site today. We're doing our best to take them to the site when the event happened. And that's just one example. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this project, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. There's a great new book called Saints of Tonga, A Century of Island Faith by Riley Moffat, Brent Anderson, and my colleague Fred Woods. Tonga has by far the highest percentage of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints of any country in the world. How did that happen? Especially because, at first, missionary work in Tonga actually wasn't very successful. After the Tongan mission closed for about a decade, the church returned and began harvesting the fruits from the seeds that were planted earlier. The truths of the restored gospel began resonating with the Tongan people who exhibited tremendous faith and sacrifices. 
This book tells the story of how the church grew to be such a strong influence in the kingdom of Tonga and so beloved by such a beloved people of that country. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've arrived at part two of Why Religion, and on this second segment, Professor Osler is going to continue to take us on a westward auditory journey of church history, this time giving us insights from places like Nauvoo, Illinois, and Salt Lake City, Utah. So here's Professor Casey Griffiths talking again with Professor Craig Osler about his Hallowed Ground and Sacred Journeys production. Uh, I wanted, you know, the questions you're asking too, just so people will know there's so many more involved than just me. I'm a producer, uh, but we tried to involve as many faculty as we could. We utilized Lloyd Newell, who, you know, music and the spoken it, it, word. It is nice to walk through the Smith Farm and hear the voice of music and the uh, spoken word <laughs> Yes, uh, explaining to you about the Smiths. This log home, built on the side of the original, is a replica of the Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mac Smith family home. During the time... You know, we had a... When you mentioned going west, I'll just mention with Lloyd, he's there uh, in Palmyra. You know, he, he, he's so gracious and so good. When we're in... in uh, Nauvoo, we had made special arrangements with the Community of Christ to have permission to film in their church history sites, which if you've been there, you know that uh, they actually ask you not even to take a, a photograph with your iPhone. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go in and film. And they're so gracious and good. And of course, we've had a good relationship with them. Uh, I have personally with Lachlan Mackay for 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. And Locke was over those sites and now is a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in their church. And has an opportunity to open those things to us. And so I wanted to go back and film on their sites and have Lachlan Mackay actually talk to us about it because he's the expert and he has, he's a descendant of you know the Smith, of the Smith family. And so we get there and we start with Lloyd Newell. And uh, I have some things I've written up for Lloyd to be able to share. And Lloyd starts speaking and then I ask Lachlan, I said, okay, now we'd like you to. And he goes, I am not going to be on any video where I am having to have me speak after just hearing him. <laughs> and so instead, he coached Lloyd and let him in everywhere. And so he took us with Lloyd, Lachlan did, and we were able to film everywhere, places that people who go to Nauvoo never get to see. What are some of those places? Well, that... one that's, I guess, to me, the, the most kind of a fun part, if you watch a video, and we're still going through peer review on some videos. It takes a long process to get these ready and make sure, you know, that it's, everything's going to be good for a few more years, at least, to how we understand church history. Uh, one of the bedrooms in the mansion house has a uh, false, or has, yeah, like a, in a closet, has a false door. Mm. And then there's a place where, as they imagine, Joseph Smith could hide when these people from Missouri are coming illegally trying to, take him back to Missouri again after he's left, you know. <laughs> and he let us go in there, and Lloyd's showing them. He says, let me show you. If you take this, you know, and it's like a little place you can hang clothes that covers you can't see where the door opens and shuts. And he lets us go in there and take that off and open up the door in the, the secret door in the closet, show where, you know, the hiding place was <laughs> up above, which most people don't have that opportunity. And so... Again, we're taking them there as if they were there when the prophet Joseph Smith's there. And we don't have any indication Joseph ever used it. But uh, anyone in church history, if you study that Nauvoo period, knows that it was a, a constant uh, challenge to Joseph, the people from Missouri who were now upset that he got out, you know, because they had no reason really to keep him. It didn't last long, unfortunately, because... There's opposition to the Lord's work, and uh, he still provided a place of safety and refuge for us out in the uh, Rocky Mountains, you know, with uh, Brigham Young and the tens of thousands who crossed the plains to come out to the Great Salt Lake Valleys and up and down the Wasatch Front Corridor, I guess from Mexico all the way up to Canada. <laughs> I wanted to bring that up next. Uh, when I when I reviewed the videos, I was sort of surprised to find that a lot of these locations are in Salt Lake. They're not... Yeah. Uh, they're not way back east. They're, they're places where, you know, near church headquarters, 
What are some of the hidden gems in and around Salt Lake that people might not be aware of? <laughs> yeah, I had a comment. That they could go visit. Yeah. We started with Salt Lake first because it was close by, and we're mm-hmm. learning how to film. I mean, this project's been going for nearly 20 years. Mm-hmm. And in Salt Lake, we found that when people outside of the United States in particular think of the church, they first think of Salt Lake City. And we thought, oh my goodness. You know, we're in Salt Lake, so we're thinking of Palmyra and Kirtland, Ohio, and and Carthage Jail, they're thinking of Salt Lake City. And so we took them, you know, we went and we have over 50 different locations uh, in, in Salt Lake that we filmed. And when you say, what is just one of them, uh, still to me, uh, is just going to the, the tabernacle there on Temple Square. Mm-hmm. It is just, it gives you a feeling of uh, what was taking place, you know, with that early time period in, in uh, church history, and it's fascinating. That particular video on the tabernacle received an award within the uh, filming community. It's called a Silver Telly Award, <laughs> and it's the highest award you can receive. And you can see Lloyd Newell sitting on the rafters <laughs> describing how the tabernacle was built, and they loved it. Brigham Young appointed an experienced bridge builder, Henry Grow, to oversee construction and to build unprecedented huge elliptical trusses that span the width of the building without intermediate supports. The arches were constructed of timbers pegged together with wooden dowels. And talking about, uh, so people feel like, oh, we've been to Salt Lake too. When you say hidden gems, one of them is the McCune Mansion. Now, it's privately owned, but they're open to have people come and uh, take a tour. It's a striking structure. I remember <laughs> seeing it as a kid and thinking, whose house is that? Yeah, so uh, Alfred... It has, a, it has an interesting story. Yeah, Alfred McCune had that mansion built for his wife, Elizabeth. They were back at the turn of the... I mean, in the early, early 1900s, 1901. Mm-hmm. But it came in a time period when uh, people in the world were looking at this group of strange Christians, if they even consider us Christians in Salt Lake, and that we had to be some kind of lesser beings and didn't have any refinement. And the McCune Mansion shows just the opposite. It is so refined. And uh, Elizabeth McCune uh, takes lead in uh, helping people to see, no, we are building... uh, just like they had the gem on the Mississippi kind of thing, you know, with Nauvoo. We're going to build a place here in Salt Lake that people will want to come to because of its beauty. Uh, with that, uh, comparing Nauvoo and Salt Lake City, mm-hmm. they did, I mean, you kind of hinted. Uh, Casey was my student here at BYU years ago. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> yeah. long ago, yes. Yeah. Is that I teased for years now is the Lord gave a swamp to the saints to, to tame in Nauvoo. And they did a real good job. And then he gets a smile on his face and the Lord says, mm, okay, now you've done a swamp. Let's see how you do with a barren desert. <laughs> you know, since Salt, and it's a beautiful city. It's one of the, I think, I love Salt Lake City. It's just, it's incredible mm-hmm. what has grown up out of that desert. And uh, mm-hmm. McCune Mansion would be a fun video, I think, for people to watch and, and see. Uh, the Lion House uh, is another one that uh, people go to that you may not be as familiar with to have them see what was happening. But many of those uh, um, videos that you could watch will help you understand better what was happening in early uh, Salt Lake City in the, the pioneer days in particular more than anything else. If you're interested in watching Professor Osler's really insightful videos of Hallowed Ground and Sacred Journeys, you can go to byujourneys.org. Again, that's byujourneys.org where you can see all of these videos. There's about a hundred of them. Or we've put a link to it in our Why Religion webpage at whyreligion.byu.edu. I highly recommend you take a look at them and use them. For this last segment of Why Religion, we like to talk with the professor about why the professor chose to be a religious educator, why they believe, and why they choose faith. So we wrap up this episode with Professor Craig Osler sharing a little bit about his own hallowed ground and sacred journeys of his own personal faith. This is my 43rd year in church education that I'm completing. So Uh, 43 years. Can you summarize maybe how you 
have developed your testimony and uh, how how you've managed to maintain your testimony amidst all the complexities of church history and doctrine, all the controversies that you've uh, seen and experienced and, and, and what you've learned. Well, yeah, it's, it's pretty deeply ingrained in me. One is that uh, I, uh, as you know, even a young man, had a deep love and testimony of Book of Mormon in particular, but uh, loved my seminary experience just drank it in. I just, I loved what I was learning as a young man. But uh, I've had personal experiences uh, where, I guess I can say it this way, that uh, if suddenly everybody had amnesia but me, I still would know that God lives and that he has spoken to me and testified to me that Jesus Christ is his son and testified to me that I'm his son in a much different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nothing can take that from me. And as a young uh, freshman here at BYU pre-mission, uh, like many others, uh, I was kind of uh, put things off to do projects, you know, and I had a, a course where we were to go do a research paper, right? It was a Book of Mormon course. Well, by the time I went to the library to check out the books, you know, so I could do my research, all the books that were uh, faithful volumes on church history were gone. <laughs> and the only thing that was left really was anti-Mormon. I didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember picking up some of them and having my first, you know, like, now what? And But I knew it was, you know, the truth was the gospel. And so I set it aside and kept thinking, there's got to be an answer to this question. There's got to be an answer. And it particularly had to do with when Brigham Young passed away. I remember, I, I mean, this is 40 almost 50 years ago now. Mm -hmm. But when Brigham Young died, his own family had to sue the church to get their property. Mm -hmm. And they made a big deal out of it. And the more I looked at it, then I started finding out, well, part of it was is that, uh, no, the tr it's because they didn't differentiate between what was Brigham Young's personal property and what was church property. If you look at it, he lived on church property, basically. Mm -hmm. And that he actually had what I'd call those that uh, were dissident who were just trying to cause trouble for the church. And I thought, well, that was pretty easy. And so I started learning early on that, well, just wait. Let the Lord show his hand. You've you got to put it on the shelf, and it'll, you'll get it and understand it well. The other thing that happened, uh, if I jumped to, you know, I talked about going to the church history sites and, and incredible experiences that uh, just permeated all the way through my eternal soul completely and uh, carried it with me that uh, I studied all I could. I'd been on, on faculty here, I guess, maybe three years. When Joseph Fielding McConkie, I'd given him a real hard time challenging him on things, mm -hmm. but not mean-spirited, just teasing him almost. And, and uh, it really paid off because he came to me and he says, I'm going to give you the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> And I said, what have you got in mind, Joseph? And he says, I have a dream that I want to write a commentary, a volume on the revelations of the Restoration, which would be Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price and, you know, in particular. It's but, all in there in the book, too, chronologically. Yeah. Which and, is really valuable. Yeah. But uh, we, so what happened, though, is to write that commentary, we, not, we didn't just take section by section, we took it verse by verse and phrase by phrase. And that caused me, I'd done some research obviously before that, but to delve into every phrase of the revelations, the doctrine and covenants, all of the editing that had taken place over years of a change to clarify or to combine revelations into one with instructions. And, uh, and I received a lot of help outside of just research from uh, the Lord and understanding what was there. And it came so that when people attack church history, you know, things in church history or bring ideas up, I dealt with it. I'd already found what that phrase meant or what was really happening. We used the example of the United Firm. Uh, I was asked to write articles on the United Firm because it became evident that uh, there was reason Joseph had changed the names in the Revelation to United Order, mm -hmm. or uh, but to then to understand how the Lord has had to protect His kingdom, and that there are those that sometimes we trust, 
that uh, proved to be uh, less than wanting to build the kingdom of God. So what counsel would you give today to a student that's kind of navigating those complexities of church history? How would you help them get through that with their testimony intact and even stronger? One is uh, don't, this just sounds bad, go to the original source. One of the things I have done is that uh, when people will say something, I say, well, I'm going to read it myself in the original source. Mm-hmm. What does it say and does it say what they say it does? And most often it doesn't. And if it does, then I want to find out what was the context of what was taking place. Um, and I think that's number one. And two is evaluate the source. I, I wonder sometimes if, if the problem is we live in this, this age where instantaneous gratification is what we go for and, yeah. and the whole world around seems to want to provoke an immediate response. And you're saying take a little bit of time and let these things oh. develop in your mind and ponder and search. And that's kind of when the answers emerge, not instantaneously, but over time when you've had a, a few moments to reflect yeah. and, and let the ideas develop in your mind. Let the Lord give you vision. Visions are not over. The heavens being opened is not over. But it doesn't happen to those who are not taking time and making sacrifices. When I think back of the most incredible, I don't want to call them, just poignant experiences spiritually I've had with revelation, they've often come after an incredible trial. Like, are you, do you really believe? Do you really believe? Then you're going to have to show it. And sometimes it's a week later, sometimes a month later, when it's like I thought that I had gone to the end of being able to handle the challenge and said, no, I do know it's true. I do know. And God knows I know. So now what am I going to do? (laughs) I'm going to hang in there. Then the heavens are opened and you receive answers that you need. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was created by the fabulous BOU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.